In Torah right now, we are in, um, I was just sharing that we're almost by the sea, right? So we're in the book of Exodus. And last time we were together for a Nefesh Shabbat, well, a Nefesh Friday night. There was a Nefesh last um, Shabbat morning. But when we were together at, at nighttime, we were beginning the Exodus journey in this, the book of names of Shemot. And we learned so quickly, so much happened. So in case you missed it, here's the uh, catching up on seasons past, or episode, past episode. Not even a whole season, an episode. It happened just like one Parsha, so much it happened, and then another second Parsha, so much happened so fast. So here we are. Um, Moses is born. It's a hard time in Mitzrayim, in the narrow place. Um, Moses becomes um, the child of an open adoption. His sister Miriam follows him, makes sure he's safe, and he both is raised with his birth family and with Pharaoh's daughter and the adopted family of the, um, of the Pharaoh. And so here Moses has this life connected to both his people and to the oppressors. And so an incredibly unique position. And then he has an incident with a taskmaster who he strikes when, they, when the taskmaster was hurting the Hebrew slave. And Moses is gone. He's out, way gone, out, out, married, becomes a shepherd, is good. Thank you. And then comes upon... The bush that is burning but not consumed. And as we all know from last time, God says, take your shoes off, Moses. You're on holy ground. And there is a conversation, and there is incredible resistance on Moses' part, even though who better than Moses to do this very thing, to go back into the place he had left and to ask, let my people go. Moses doesn't want to do it. Pharaoh doesn't want to listen. And there's a lot of going back of saying something and no one listening. And in the initial interaction, Moses is also worried, not just that Pharaoh's not going to listen to him, but that his own people are not going to listen to him. And turns out he was right. I mean, he wasn't making it up. They were, they were like, why are you doing this? Please stop. You're making it harder on us, right? Because once he does go to Pharaoh and say, Shalach et ami, otherwise known as let my people go, Pharaoh says, oh, actually, you know what? Um, let's go ahead and say that all the bricks you had to make before we gave you the straw, now you have to collect the straw, make as many bricks and work twice as hard. And they were like, you know what? You, you, could, you could take your, like, helping us out thing, Moses, and go away. And you can imagine at that moment, he was already like, I said that I wasn't the right person. I said this was going to happen. And in fact, he comes back to how he communicates and says, I told you I have this speech impediment. It's not me. I'm not the right one. And God has to double down again and says, yes, it is. It is definitely you. It is definitely this time. And then back to Pharaoh. And there are plagues. And there's a moment of listening, of hearing, and then a hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Every time it seems like, oh, wait, we're going to have a moment, actually, where we're going to be heard. Moses talking to the people, no, nope, not hearing that. Moses talking to Pharaoh, yeah, maybe I will let your people go. No, nope, not going to do that. Frustrated communication everywhere, everywhere you turn. And so there was a beautiful teaching by the Sfat Emet, the Sfas Emes, who taught on this that we usually think that it's a talker who makes a listener. But it turns out it's the listener who allows for there to be a talker. 
and certainly in prophecy, that is true. If you're a prophet and nobody's listening to you, it's the people willing to listen that make you a prophet. Hear my people and I will speak. That's what we hear in the Psalms. Hear my people. First, hear my people and I will speak. Not the other way around. So then the Sfatimid continues and says, well, so then what do you need to be able to hear? And again, just to be clear, this is not auditory hearing. This is deep learning hearing, taking in. Sfatimid says hearing requires being empty of everything. Hearing requires being empty of everything. And then goes on to say, this is the essence of exile for us, of galut now in our times. This time was different, but we can say now too. It's our inability to empty ourselves, our inability to empty, to take in the divine. He goes on to share, there's so many trappings of vanity, so many distractions of vanity. So much in your feed all the time. It's ridiculous. Somebody was showing me like there's this constant Instagram feed that like unaffordable houses all over the world. Find a $29,000 uh, cabin in Finland and a $59,000 house in Indiana. Not sure what that's giving us other, other than just like, oh my God, it's ridiculous what we deal with here. Yes, there's that. It's just, it's just everything, all the time, right? Materialism, the shiny objects, the things that are supposed to be what we worship here in this culture. But they are distractions from emptying from everything. And then, ah, uh, then there is the overwhelming pain and tragedy it also makes it hard to empty. Like Pharaoh, how are we not just walking around with hardened hearts? When Carl of blessed memory died here on the stairs, the police officer who came over said, oh yeah, yeah, this happens every day. That was the response. This happens every day. Yeah, this happens every day, but that is horrible. And when we get to a place where our hearts do, don't know, doesn't know the pain of it, then that's a place where we're not listening. We're not able to. Part of what we're emptying is the hardening. Part of what we're letting go is our hardening against the suffering of the world, which, friends, we have to stay open to. Sfat Emmet tells us that we mention the Yitziat Mitzrayim, the leaving of Egypt, before we say the Shema in the Song of the Sea. When we pray every day in the morning time, we pray the Song of the Sea. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. I like the Song of the Sea, too. We pray the Song of the Sea that has Micha Mocha in it. It has Adonai in Loch Leolam and the Song of the Sea. We pray it because it precedes us being able to let go of everything to enter into the Shema, to empty in order to enter into the Shema. We need to feel the mud in our toes. That moment of leaving, of the Yitziat Mitzrayim, of the willingness to let it all go, the willingness to walk into the water that then came mud, to feel it on our toes and in our bodies, to let it go in order to hear, in order to chant the Shema and listen to the divine, to listen to ourselves, to listen to each other. I had some days this week where I was able to go, this past week, where I was able, not this past, whatever, the week before what we just ended here. 
last week, I think that's called. <laughs> you can imagine what it's like if I'm your mom. Where's that thing where you wash and <laughs> the bath? Yeah. Um, so last week, I was able to go away and take some time to be quiet. Ooh, a main seva, so good. And it creates so much possibility to be in a place of quiet, to be in a place of intentional emptying. It's what we get to do every week on Shabbat together and why, partly why Sabbath is so important to us. And it's indeed, it's a midah, everyone, for our practice. Shtika, silence, is a midah. And we get to practice this. So it's so funny, right? I get to go away for a few days. I'm in this place. I'm coming back. I'm thinking about all of you. And I was like, yeah, and then I'll talk about silence. <laughs> that does not feel right. So I am going to in a moment, stop with the words, and we are going to enter into an experience together of silence and of emptying. One thing that's characteristic of our Jewish practice is that um, we don't entirely leave for years at a time, right? We don't have a monastic tradition. We do our spirituality here together, each of us personally emptying inside of a collective empty. It's very powerful. But you do it, I do it, we're doing this together. And that as we do this, it uplifts how we can all open to each other. The ability to not say, I have to go by myself somewhere and find the perfect conditions to be just the right place to get to the empty, and it'll never happen. So just as a reminder, we are never going for perfection. We are always going for growth. So in this, there's a way in which sitting next to the person who you know is trying, as we all are trying, gives us permission to try together. So, let us take this moment to enter into a practice of emptying that is going to center on our breaths. I know usually I don't do this at this point, but lucky you, you're here tonight. Some of you are already like, this is not for me. So I'm going to give you an option if you're one of those people in a moment. So we're going to stick close to our breath because in the book of Grace Sheet in Genesis, at the very, very beginning of Torah, we're told that God forms the human, the Adam, from the Adama, from the earth. And then God breathes into the nostrils of this Adam, Adam, of this human, the breath of life through the nose. Nefesh Chaya. The breath of life into the nose. And we're going to begin there so that we become a living being. Nefesh Chaya, we are a living being. Nefesh. Collectively, we are Nefesh living and individually. So, we are going to try to make room for this breath now so that in our days, we notice maybe how we are hardening or distracting beyond the place where we can listen. So do what you need to do to get into a place that feels comfortable. And we're going to begin with this breath of life through our nose. And we're going to follow it. If this is your idea of hell, to be sitting quietly with a group of people, breathing, I see you. Here's what I'm going to invite as we follow the breath. That you just watch, ah, angry, ah, annoyed, ah, when is this going to be over? 
And just pay attention to that. I welcome you to do that. Yes? And if you feel like it, you can also follow your breath. But you don't need to. So we're going to breathe in through the nose. Breathing in the life. Chaim. You can even imagine that you're bringing the, the life, the breath is being breathed into your nose as you take an inhale. And it travels down your throat and all the way down into your belly. And at the end, there's a pause. And you're going to wait at the end of that pause for the inhale to come in on its own. And everybody doing this on your own time, breathing in through your nose, letting the breath travel down your throat into your belly, and then letting it pause in a place of empty. And then letting the breath come to you without trying. After the empty, the breath returns. And you can have the experience of being breathed. You do not have to will your breath. The breath returns on its own, always. In through your nose, down to your belly, and exhale. Empty. Can that pause get longer? to receive the light. May I be empty and open to receive. May I be full and open to receive the light. May I be full and open to receive. May I be empty and open to receive. 
Beautiful. Well, I, I just, just appreciate. It's not something we normally do. It's a little bit vulnerable. Everybody moved 